Welcome to this episode of Autodesk Simulation TV. Simulation in action. We're going to discuss response spectrum. What happens to my part under shock loads? My name is Pat Tessero and I'll be your guide through this process. Today we're going to, and let me move over to this side. Uh, I have a structure here, I have a structure that I've created within the simulation environment and it represents a simple frame structure of a building several floors and what we want to consider is some sort of shock load that's imposed on the model. Got a picture of some results here. I'm going to move over again. Keeps me busy. And uh, the way we're going to perform this analysis is we're going to perform two analyses. First we're going to perform a modal analysis then we're going to perform a response spectrum analysis. A response spectrum analysis is a way to consider earthquake loading and seeing a static result from this dynamic analysis. The first step will be to perform a modal analysis. Uh, we'll start with a, a meshed model that can originate either from a CAD imported model that is then meshed automatically or in this case we've created geometry within the simulation interface that was meshed. We'll define the material, apply boundary conditions, perform the modal analysis. We're going to review <coughs> the log files associated with this analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. And our goal is we're going to verify the amount of modal effective mass that's considered during the modal analysis. And this is important because when we perform our subsequent response spectrum analysis, we would like to make sure that we consider enough modes that we get a converged result. By the Uniform Building Code, the recommendation is 90% of modal effective mass participating in the direction of loading. The next step We'll perform the response spectrum analysis. We'll have to change the analysis type. That'll copy the design scenario. We'll adjust the analysis parameters. We're going to want, we will import a uh, spectra that will be applied to the model. We'll define a direction for our loading and adjust our factor to reflect whatever compliance code we're using. We'll perform the analysis and we'll get a chance to review the results. Okay, so I'm going to open up our model, which I have right here. <clears throat> if I rotate this model a little bit, we'll get an idea of what this thing looks like. So we have different floors. They're offset from one another. And uh, I've got some boundary conditions on the, the bottom of these. And the way that I apply the boundary conditions is I'm going to use a rectangular select and select vertices. I could select these vertices at the very bottom of the model and then I could right click and choose to add general boundary conditions and then I can make these fixed. Since I already have them on my model I'm not going to add any additional boundary conditions. After we would define our element definition, our element type, we would then run our initial analysis. I've already defined this information for this model uh, this is a multi-part assembly and uh, I think the definition of our beam cross-sectional properties is not the primary purpose of this presentation. So let's run the analysis and see how we re review our log file. And our analysis is completed. I think the most direct method to view the log file is to visit the report tab. In the report report tab in the lower left hand corner we will click on the analysis log file. We'll scroll down until we see for the direction of interest our modal effective mass. Here in the X direction we could see that we have a value of 87 percent. For this analysis that's not adequate. So I'm going to go back to the FEA editor and I'm going to visit the analysis parameter screen. Instead of the requested five modes, that's default, I'm going to change this to ten requested modes, choose OK, and then rerun the analysis. 
So I'm going to go back to the report tab and verify the modal effective mass. And uh, we could see here now that it's 96%. That exceeds our minimum level if I were trying to comply to the uniform building code. And I know that I could use these modal results for my subsequent response spectrum analysis. The next step would be to right click on the analysis type and choose to define our response spectrum analysis. A question will come up asking if I'd like to copy the design scenario. I'll say yes. I don't make any changes to the model, to the boundary conditions, to the element definition because everything that's considered during this analysis comes from modal analysis. What we need to do is edit the analysis parameters. I will need to indicate the design scenario from which the modal analysis will, will be uh, used. and In this case, it's design scenario number three. I'll indicate the direction. And this will also consider the factor which will be used. So there may be several conditioning factors that are required for my compliance code. Next, I'm going to import a curve. So I'm going to browse for this file, and there are several curves that come with the UBC. And if I'm interested in a stiff clay or type 2 soil, I might choose the appropriate uh, curve here. And I can see my spectra data. And I'm going to make one more change because I know that this spectra data is in terms of G's versus period. I'll choose OK, and then I'll run my analysis. Now there's theories involved with earthquake analysis using this analysis type. And uh, one theory is that you, you make your, your model very stiff. And that way it's, it'll be strong and it will resist uh, types of loads. And for earthquake, that's not necessarily true. So uh, sometimes it's important to make a more flexible model that can move opposing the shock load and that will reduce the stresses. So in this model we can see that we have uh, deflections, we can verify various results and we could see that our our maximum result here which is uh, 71,000 psi is excessive. So uh, by using this analysis type we can experiment with different geometry and find that balance of model flexibility and mass that results in reduced stresses. Let's just take a look at that quickly. If I wanted to add additional geometry, I can go back to my original model, and I'm going to copy my design scenario. In this case, I'm going to activate an additional part, which introduces some stiffening members into the geometry. Now I need to rerun my modal analysis. So I'm going to run that analysis. This already has the parameters that I previously defined. And I'll go through this process once more. So if we need to modify the geometry, we need to repeat the two-step process of the modal analysis first, then the response spectrum. We'll take a look at our report in our log file to confirm what we have. And I see that I have 82% modal effective mass. We would have to increase the number of requ requested modes. In lieu of that, I'm just going to go on to performing the response spectrum analysis. We'll just pretend like we added the additional modes and reran the analysis. Having done that, we can indicate now our modal analysis results come from design scenario number five. We have our factor
we would import our spectrum data. And then we would run our analysis. So through this quick presentation, we're able to present the steps required to go through the response spectrum analysis preceded by a modal analysis, how we might modify our geometry, and how that affects our workflow. Thank you for watching this presentation.